Um, this is my great pleasure to introduce you all. Some of you have already met uh, today earlier, but uh, we have a great uh, guest here from the uh, University of Turku, Professor uh, Mia Borbiola. And uh, uh, what we can say is that uh, over the years uh, uh, we have noticed that Mia is very systematic. She is very organized in, uh, no, in, respect, in regarding uh, the, the, the research. She is really the master from whom I have personally learned quite a lot how to uh, make very clear research questions. And uh, uh, all the discussions and following her conference presentations, uh, it, it has always been a great pleasure because uh, even when you don't know the exact topic, she can give you a very clear introduction and very clear overview and very clear insight to that uh, topic. So uh, we are very happy to have you here today and also to teach these good tips to our PhD students. Uh, this was a very generous introduction and I don't quite know whether I deserve this praise or not, uh, probably not. I don't consider myself a particularly organized person. As a researcher I'm, I'm very messy, but I love research and I love sources and uh, hopefully this will um, be uh, seen also by you today in the discussion and um, let's hope that my voice doesn't break because I have a flu coming on and I've been already talking for four hours today and I commiserate with um, um, almost all of you because you have been already listening to me for four hours so you really deserve a medal for, for your endurance in this sense and I don't know where I should be looking because there are so many uh, places to look. But anyway, and this uh, presentation today is coming from my personal uh, experiences and personal topics. So please take this into consideration. And here I have chosen a nice source. It's nice not only because it's um, an important work uh, of Swedish uh, legal practice, legal literature from the 17th century, but it's a customized version because here you can see a very exotic, I don't know if it's a soldier, not a Swedish soldier I'm sure, but someone has depicted this uh, very, I don't know if it's oriental or, or from the new world or uh, from where, but anyway. So, and um, Considering that I have been already speaking for four hours, uh, and um, so I would very much like you to discuss with me again. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, even those who are joining us by Skype, Dele, um, and to, to the other camera as well, um, hopefully even you on the other end of the virtual um, link can also participate. And uh, when I go, I have a task for, for the listeners today to um, discuss a certain topic. So perhaps you can, if not discuss all by yourselves, but at least uh, think about it and perhaps participate in the discussion after the discussion in groups. Okay? So let's go forward. And I apologize to those students who have already uh, seen some of these no, slides today. Luckily, I'm not able to understand Estonian so well that I uh, understood the comments. Um, but as I said, uh, some of these slides have already been shown today. Uh, so I apologize to all those students who have already seen them. But as I didn't know exactly what the audience would be, uh, and I'm going to discuss more or less the same things. So I'm going to show them one more time. So what is legal history? So uh, legal history is part of the general jurisprudential studies, uh, which doesn't say much uh, to a layman, but ba layman basically uh, it's about, um, you could call them um, uh, methodological or um, 
they help uh, understand law better and how law works uh, together with society. And the sister disciplines of legal history, uh, sociology of law, which basically uh, discusses the nexus of law and society, and law and economics that, like its name says, obviously focuses on the relationship of law and economy, uh, various economic aspects and theories, and so on. So, um, there is an interdependency between law and society, and while uh, sociology of law looks at it uh, at the present day, uh, the legal history does it in a historical perspective. And the historical perspective can be very, very wide. So, especially in um, Scandinavia and, and Estonia as well, Finland, it's an independent discipline and professors of legal history luckily don't have to teach any other topic. They can concentrate on their one true love, legal history. Uh, and to summarize basically the method, whatever that is, and we have been today discussing earlier on uh, what is the historical method. Um, that is historical and the topic comes from all its lead. If one wants to uh, draw parallels in other faculties, like uh, the Faculty of Theology or the Faculty of Social Sciences, I'm sure the structure is different here in Bakl at the moment. Um, its sister disciplines in other faculties are ecclesiastical history in theology, uh, political history and social history in the social sciences, and perhaps to some extent also economic history and of course all um, people who, all the persons who are studying to become uh, economists um, are also doing economic history and I learned today that uh, Babu is very strong uh, in the field of uh, history of medicine and of course uh, future doctors will need uh, to know something about that. But the geographical scope is huge because a legal historian can study whatever place in the world they want, so the scope is global. The temporal scope also, also ranges from the code of Hammurabi and its predecessors going back almost 4,000 years until today, so even very contemporary events and contemporary legal history is included. So basically, one of the nice things about legal history um, is that one can study whatever one wants, wherever one wants, and whatever period one wants, to summarize it. And as a repetition, of what we already talked about today, um, what kind of research questions does legal history usually ask and attempt to answer? These questions can include questions like what was law like, which is a descriptive question, why, law, and why does it look the way it does at a particular period, which is perhaps more analytical. One of the um, important topics in legal history research is often about the changes in law or failed changes. Um, sometimes there are law drafts, for example, that are not successful. Then the law doesn't change, even though one attempts to change it. So, um, even these, these questions, why this failed, why the law reform aborted, are also very re relevant. And the why question pops up again, why did it fail? So, and, and another 
very classical topic in legal history involves reception processes of law. So, um, why is um, why does a norm, for example, travel from place to place? Why does a legal uh, is why is a legal institution adopted in a new place? There are ancient examples of it from, let's say, uh, the ancient Near East, as we have been discussing today earlier on, and of course, um, in contemporary life, we can also witness these reception processes, for example, in the field of criminal law, in the field of procedural law, in commercial law, in all fields, more or less. Any questions or comments so far? Or from our Skype participants? And now I come to a perhaps a controversial topic. Different schools of legal history. Um, as I said, uh, there are some basic groups of questions we usually ask our sources, some research questions. Um, but in practice, if one thinks about, for example, Europe, um, there are very different approaches to legal history and legal historical research. Uh, and I don't want to name uh, countries uh, representing either, either perspective, uh, perhaps here, but um, let's say that the legal history, history tradition is um, much more national traditionally in some countries, whereas other countries uh, have adopted more comparative perspectives. Um, often the big countries tend to be uh, more uh, self-sufficient and don't consider perhaps um, reception processes and compar compar um, comparative perspectives so important. It's enough that they study their own legal system and they don't need to look elsewhere. But for analytical purposes, comparative perspectives are really important. Uh, nowadays, this question of national versus comparative uh, can also be mirrored uh, in some very practical issues in doing legal history research. Uh, because it's a very important question what language one chooses to do one's research in, what is one's publication language, and also what is one's publication forum or fora in the plural. So, uh, as we know, uh, and I suppose that um, the university, is, uh, university in uh, Estonia is also under pressure of um, internationalization, we are supposed to be international, we are supposed to publish in high impact factor journals, if that has any bearing in the field of law, sometimes it does. Um, at least my own university uh, is encouraging us to um, publish in more high ranking journals and pub high ranking publishers, uh, there is a national ranking system for all publishers and all journals in Finland and people, of course, are doing strategic decisions when choosing where to publish and where not to publish. So, obviously, uh, whether one does natural, nat national or comparative research also has its bearing on these very practical issues in which language to publish and where to publish. But then if one wants to differentiate between various schools, if one wants to call them like that, or perhaps cultures of legal history, um, one can also distinguish uh, between various approaches. Um, some are closer to a history of ideas kind of approach, um, looking at uh, more like intellectual history and um, the history 
or um, ideas, concepts, and so on. Whereas others uh, have a wider social, social cultural, cultural approach, uh, looking largely at law and legal phenomena as um, products of a culture in various country or various region. So that is perhaps a wider approach then, and one has to use other kinds of sources and ask other kinds of questions if you have this kind of approach. So it's very practical really. It's related to the research questions asked and the sources used. They all are linked together. One cannot really separate one from the other. This I don't see it like that. Perhaps theoretically, but not in practice. But I would like to emphasize that this is not a value statement and that there is no one right approach or way of doing legal historical research. Everyone can choose their own path regardless of what other people do. And um, it's often the topic that um, comes first and then of course the rest follows. Okay, but as I'm um, part of uh, the European Society of Comparative Legal History. I am duty bound to mention it here and also our very interesting journal, Comparative Legal History, publishing comparative cutting edge legal history research. Okay, now I have my duty and we can move on. And then, then um, coming to my own country, my own traditions in Finland, I thought that I would illuminate this school question by some very practical examples, my own colleagues. So, um, even though we make personal choices, we can't separate our culture, our university culture and our legal education from um, the personal choices we make. And of course we are under the influence of the scientific traditions of our home countries and home universities. And in Finland we have been talking about uh, the schools, legal history schools of Helsinki and Turku. Of course Helsinki um, is the former academy of Turku that was founded uh, many centuries ago, but the Turku Law Faculty was only uh, established in 1961, so it's a newcomer in the field um, in that sense. But uh, they have had uh, rather different research profiles. Uh, first, considering my new uh, home university Turku, um, there the lawyers Otto Busin, Lars Björne and Päili Basto have been uh, the, most, the best known representatives of perhaps what one would call the Turku School of Legal History in Finland. Uh, it has been closer to the history of ideas and legal theory. Uh, the topics uh, chosen by the Turku School have been largely jurisprudence, legal science and history of ideas. But here I would like to mention that the doctoral dissertation of Lars Björne has been an exception because it was on political justice in Finland uh, in the white years uh, between the two wars, world wars. So that was a different uh, approach. But uh, after that um, important uh, dissertation, uh, last year they moved to study uh, the history of ideas and jurisprudence, especially of the Nordic countries. So he has a series of books on that topic. So we have here um, Lars Björne and Kai Pasta, who, who unfortunately um, passed away very suddenly, um, almost a decade ago. Then to the so-called Helsinki School. So um, the first representative of this school um, 
was, uh, well, they were actually, it was founded by historians. So there is a difference there that there were lawyers in Norway and historians in Helsinki. So uh, the historians uh, Julia Lundqvist and Heikki Ylikalmas became um, first but became legal history professors at the Faculty of Law. And they brought with them uh, changes uh, in the approaches and subjects chosen. So the topics in Helsinki during this period were largely legal professions of various kinds, uh, historical criminology, and so on. Uh, the successor of Yuri Karnas in, in Helsinki was uh, Juha Kekkonen, who is now still uh, the chair, uh, has the chair in legal history and Roman law. Uh, he has um, made his mark especially in discussing political uh, processes, in trials, and uh, also the Finnish civil war and so on. Um, in Helsinki also uh, two other legal historians, Pigaletta Vanama and Heikki Vihlainaki, have represented a more global outlook on legal history. But what, what one can actually say is that uh, as a factor that everyone has shared in Finland, regardless of which school they represent, is that uh, everyone has shared a comparative perspective. So no one has been uh, seeing Finland as an uh, island or an isolated country. Um, no, that is not the case. Finland has been also always seen in interaction with other legal cultures. Reception processes have been very important in research and also um, comparative research between various countries, like uh, the recent book by Jukka Ekkonen, which compares the, civil, the legal repression uh, after the civil war of Finland and the civil war of Spain, for example. This is a classical uh, comparative study between two countries. So the comparative perspective is generally shared in Finland and has been for decades. Then um, to something that I could call juridical legal sources. And by legal sources I, and perhaps traditionally, um, is used uh, those sources that are produced uh, by a legislator, for example. The judiciary, um, various legal actors, and that they have a legal content. So not all um, sources produced, for example, uh, by the judicial system are necessarily legal. They can be totally administrative, for example, um, and so on. But the black letter law, such as laws, statutes, decrees, norms and regulations of various kinds, um, are, of course, classical uh, sources of law. The same applies, of course, to jurisprudence. All the works that uh, legal scholars write, for example. And also, preparatory works of norms, travaux uh, preparatoires, that uh, exist at least from the 16th century, so we're not talking about a modern phenomenon here. And then, of course, we must also remember that there are not only written sources of law, but also unwritten sources of law, such as custom, customer law, and so on. Of course, nowadays it doesn't have a, a, such an important role, um, as, in, as it has had in many countries, um, for example, in Eastern Europe. <coughs> Sorry. Hmm. Then, of course, the archives of 
the judicial and legal offices and actors also contain relevant juridical legal sources. So various uh, state offices, for example, the uh, archives of the so-called legality controllers. In Finland we have both the Chancellor of Justice and the Parliamentary Ombudsman who have their own archives. And then of course all courts of law in various shapes and sizes and periods. The faculties of law have their own archives that are also uh, that fall under this category, and also law firms. Of course, these are private actors, and access to the archives of law firms can be difficult. Why is this? This is a question to the audience. Anyone from the Skype connection wanting to answer this question? why access to the archives of law firms could be um, relevant but uh, difficult. Trust. 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 Yes. yes. Thank you for the answer. Precisely. Precise. Because there is a, a special uh, confidentiality, um, confidential relationship between um, uh, the advocate uh, or solicitor and the client. So, um, access to the archives of law firms um, can be um, difficult. Um, but I must still say that there are some uh, very old Finnish law firms that have been in existence from the late 19th century or early 20th century. So, they are very old and they probably have archives that one would very much uh, like to uh, do research in but um, whether one gets access is another thing. Um, then, as I mentioned, court records in all forms and sizes and legal practice in general. Of course, this can also be in the um, format of law reports, for example, or uh, summarized cases in law journals, which has also been practiced practice in at least some law journals in some periods. Then artwork, artifacts and buildings can also be legal sources or juridical legal sources. And um, you perhaps don't see what the text says in that. What do you think that is? It's worn around the neck. So it's kind of a medal or um, a symbol of office. And if you can see what uh, the text says, it says Tribunal um, Révolutionnaire. It's um, from the period of the French Revolution and its revolutionary courts. So this was a sign of office of one of the um, ju uh, revolutionary judges in France during the Great Revolution. So, of course, obviously these kind of artifacts can also be analyzed and used as sources of law. Then to approaches and sources. And I'm now uh, taking as an example the methodological book by John Tosh called The Pursuit of History. And it's about the method uh, methodology of uh, historical research. And it's a very nicely written book. I can recommend it to anyone who's interested in uh, how to do historical research. So, uh, um, John Tosh separates between two ideal type approaches towards sources. And these two ideal types he um, discusses in his book. It has many other things as well, by the way. But one of them he calls the source oriented approach. And when you uh, have or adopt this source oriented approach, you basically 
choose a series of sources or some particular type of sources and then you start reading them and investigate um, what they can tell you and you start doing research on those issues that they can tell you about. So it's uh, very practical in that sense. So first you look at the sources, then you ask the research questions based on what the sources can tell you. There are some risks in this approach. Firstly, uh, the content of the sources may lead the um, research to a certain direction it would not have taken if you had had um, your research questions first. And it, can, it may also skew the research because it's just one type of source. You don't um, see the rest of the world, just those sources. Um, and there is also the risk that um, if you are not very disciplined, your research may end up like an incoherent collection of facts. So if you don't kind of process and analyze the material and um, um, concentrate on certain aspects, if you want to include everything, then it might be uh, incoherent. Incoherent and um, not very analytical. Then Tosh uh, presents the problem-oriented approach, as he calls it. Uh, it um, you start by formulating some research questions, often based on the previous literature, previous studies on the topic, and then you go to your sources and seek answers to your questions in them. Um, one of the problems related to this approach is how do you necessarily know in advance what source will, what a source will be able to tell or not, and which sources actually are relevant to your research questions? Um, and there is a risk that one reproduces something that uh, already has been reproduced before, that one sticks to uh, the tradition of existing research and. Um, is not, uh, does not uh, do anything bold and innovative. So, these are the two um, ideal type approaches. Um, and uh, John Tosh um, has observed that usually there are no pure types. Uh, they usually are mixed in some sense. But according to him, and my personal experiences, I suppose, the latter approach is more often used and um, perhaps it's more systematic also. Any questions and comments on this or the schools of law? I was kind of legal history, I was kind of trying to provoke you a bit, but you uh, are not commenting on that at all. I don't know if it's a good sign or bad sign. But, um, okay, we can perhaps come to that also later on if someone uh, feels provoked and wants to say something about various schools of legal history. Generally speaking, there is of course an interaction between the sources and the researcher so that there is no pure um, ideal type approach. So basically, uh, even though you approach the sources with research questions, you obviously then um, are molded by what you see in the sources and you make adjustment, adjustments to the research questions while you try to answer them. So that there is a, a least kind of give and take and interaction all the time between your questions and your sources. But I would like to advocate also um, the reading approach, uh, of the, the approach of reading sources, because it's uh, often that way you can ask totally novel questions. 
because um, when you read the sources, something emerges that no one has perhaps thought of before. And because I love my sources and I love reading sources, um, this has led me to uh, do research um, in some fields that um, to me were a bit um, unanticipated or I was a bit surprised that I came to do research on those fields. Because reading the sources, the questions just came to my head and because I'm and I just had to know the answers to them. And that's why I'm doing um, the research projects I'm doing at the moment. So, of course, the descriptive questions come first. Like, what happened? What were the conditions of the, happen the things that happened? Um, uh, when the law changed, for example, how did it change? Um, how was it an institution introduced, or so on. These are, of course, necessary at first. But then, of course, in good research, the analytical questions will and must follow, because otherwise uh, you can't really um, answer questions like why a change took place, why uh, this um, institution was adopted and not the other option, for example. Um, why was uh, the BGB uh, used as a model for the legislation of a country? Uh, why not the court civil, etc. So there, there are options. Uh, some options are chosen and these, don't, these have a reason, usually. Some kind of reason on some kind of level. So, why did something take place? What does that suggest? What does that prove? What followed out of it? And so on. So, uh, one could describe uh, the researcher one's questions and one's reading of sources and literature like a cycle, as a cycle so that um, you get the, the int you find an interest to a certain topic through reading research literature then you look perhaps at the sources then you get new questions you read some more literature and and um, and so on so it's a cycle that evolves the whole time uh, during one's research pro um, process and I don't know if you have had this experience um, yet, um, but at least I have noticed that um, the research one starts with, uh, or one imagines one is doing when one starts it, is often very different, or at least to some degree different, than what the end product is, so that the topic and the research has evolved into some other perhaps uh, slightly unexpected directions during the research project. But um, if one has new research questions, sometimes one has to have quite uh, novel, non-traditional and innovative sources that are not perhaps so often used in legal history research. Then some words about sources and source criticism, which of course is a very core um, methodological theme in uh, historical research in general. And of course legal historical research is no exception here. So source criticism, the basics of source criticism are of course very important. So, um, and that's divided into external and internal source criticism. So the external starts by asking questions of the source and its origins. So like when, why, where, how and by whom a certain source was created or produced, regardless of what type of source it is. And also, it's important to understand, in order to assess the source, 
and what it can tell us. Uh, it's also important to understand the procedure and um, the process through which the source came into being, like for example the legal procedures. Because what we read in the court protocols, the court records, uh, when we are looking at a particular court case, are of course not a true account of what happened. There is a certain function why this document, these documents were produced. And these are of course related to um, what the court does and what the court um, is supposed to do during a court of, um, a session of law. So of course a, a court must try to find out the truth the procedural truth or some kind of um, notion of what could be true in the case and just and of course decide accordingly. And this affects what is being written down in the court records. So of course this must be understood uh, when reading the source. Mm. Of course um, the external source criticism also focuses and asks the question, um, is the author really the claimed author? So is the person who is supposed to have produced the, the source really done that? Is that plausible? Um, is the place where the document or source produced really the place? Um, uh, there is some um, problem there in my slide, but it's the time claimed, really the claimed time, not author. <laughs> so, is uh, the timing of the document really accurate or not? Um, is the document, for example, a forgery or the source, whatever kind of source that is? Is it a forgery? And if so, is it a historical forgery or modern forgery? Because um, forgeries can be produced for a reason. If so, what could that reason have been? And we know of very um, important uh, sources, like the donation of Constantine, for example, that was forged to give the church more rights and, and so on, forged um, and later on found to be a forgery. So the, it was obviously fabricated in order to support um, the claims of the church. Um, related to the external source criticism are also questions like where the source is from, so what is the convenience of that particular source? How has uh, the manuscript, for example, or document come to the archive or library and so on? What is its path? That also adds to the reliability of the source if it can be followed back. Like, for example, when art uh, dealers and um, art historians are trying to evaluate whether a piece of uh, an artwork, for example, a painting, is really a forgery or not. They try to follow the history of the painting back in time. And if you can do that, it's more likely uh, to be authentic and genuine. If it has a trace that can be followed reliably. Uh, then the contents of the source. Um, are they inwardly, oh, uh, that's an error there, typo, uh, are they inwardly conflicted or not? Uh, is it without conflicts? Um, also, the document, um, how about the form? Is it, is it using the ordinary form of producing, for example, chancery documents? Do they, does it uh, begin in the normal phrases? Does it end in the normal way, uh, and so on? So this is, a, this is a, for example, bureaucracies have a tendency to have a certain format that they follow in their documents. So this is plausible, uh, and also the style, the language, and the 
page of the document, are they authentic or not. And of course, uh, in some sources, chemical analyses might be required. Um, for example, to ascertain whether um, source is actually um, the ink is authentic um, in comparison to other inks used, for example, in the Middle Ages or in the antiquity, um, or uh, is the paper the um, the paper really from, let's say, the Middle Ages or the late Middle Ages uh, is the parchment old. Um, and of course, there are various scientific methods uh, that are very technical to authenticate uh, documents, paintings, other sources. Because of course, those are best, best left, left to experts in the field, so not to your ordinary legal <coughs> historian. We are not that kind of Indiana Jones, it would, even if it would be very nice to um, do also um, exciting things in the lab to ascertain the authenticity of our legal history sources. Of course, um, where the documents are being copied, there are also um, different variants then of texts that have been, for example, been passed from generation to generation. Um, and this is, of course, uh, an activity where errors can be made, um, passages can be left out quite inadvertently, um, words can be interpreted the wrong way, etc. So there can be differences between the different versions of the same source, and of course these must be compared and uh, perhaps the original version reconstructed from various variants. Uh, of the same source. Perhaps this applies to older uh, legal historical texts um, more than modern ones. No questions or comments? No? No? Right. Go on then. Then there is the internal source criticism. And it involves uh, interpretation of the sources. So already if one makes a transcription of a, a text, of a source text, one is already interpreting the source. Let's consider, for example, the text I have here. It's a medieval legal text, as you can see. And when one wants to use this kind of text, one is required to have expert knowledge. Because obviously the hand is different from our hands of today, and the medieval legal texts are very abbreviated, so you have to know uh, the, how the scribes uh, abbreviate texts. They are they use abbreviations as a sign of uh, their skills as a scribe. So, not only do you have to be an expert in medieval Latin, but also have expert skills in understanding, for example, these abbreviations and to be able to uh, interpret them correctly when you transcribe the text. Uh, also, you have to keep in mind what the text actually tells. And when you translate the text um, for, to another language, that requires, that requires, of course, special language skills. And you might also need uh, special language skills if you consider, for example, um, let's say, old Swedish sources or um, old variants of um, German, for example, Plattdeutsch, uh, is not the same as uh, the German language of today, so you have to have special skills, linguistic skills, uh, in order to understand um, medieval and um, early modern German texts, for example. So it's not your school German might not be enough. 
Then, of course, the terminology might be quite different from what it is today in the legal language. So you have to keep in mind that also. And some words that were used centuries ago are not used any longer, or they might have a different meaning. So that you must be very, one must be very um, careful how to translate, because uh, otherwise one simply can miss important points and information. So the language and the terminology of the period must be uh, understood. Then is the doc is the document um, type a typo there as well? Is the document reliable? Has the person who has written the account, for example, been in a position to give a reliable account? Has he or she been, for example, an eyewitness to the offence? Or is it just hearsay? Is it just a rumour that's been repeated? So these kind of considerations must be taken into account. So is it first, second, third hand knowledge? And also how long a time there has lapsed between the event that is being described and the writing down of the event. For example, um, this is very important when considering memoirs, for example. Uh, memoirs are usually written by um, people in the um, um, later years, mature, more mature years of their lives, and um, they might be uh, talking about events that have happened decades ago. So are those uh, reminiscences reliable or not? Um, and of course the attitudes and intentions of the author must also be taken into account. Like for example, um, political memoirs might try to um, embellish certain things in one's, during one's political career. Um, judges um, might not want to um, remember so exactly um, how they came to judge as they did in political trials, um, so one must take this also into account. And for example, memoirs can be written for um, a certain audience and for a certain purpose. So also this must be taken into account. What, what is the author trying to communicate? What's the message he or he, she is trying to get through to the audience? Then, of course, the larger cultural context must be taken account, into account because, um, as we all know from uh, our communications nowadays, we don't have to say, some, say everything in our communications because some things are just so obvious and uh, you don't have to say them. So that um, things simply are left unsaid because they are presupposed to be like common knowledge, for example. And um, as I said when discussing forgeries, even biased, partial or mendacious sources can be useful because they uh, elucidate attitudes and discourses that have been going on in the period, for example. So regardless of whether it's actually correct or not, they still communicate something that, again, depends on how we assess the source and what kind of research questions we ask. And of course, um, a really important part of any uh, source criticism is the comparison with the facts uh, or what the source claims, the story told by the source, with um, in connection to other sources that might bring light and elucidate the same, same thing, same events, same phenomenon, and so on. So uh, you kind of cross-examine the source 
and put it in context with other sources of the same period and, and compare the results and then decide what kind of uh, reliability the source has, what kind of um, way to give to that particular source. And of course, sometimes it's quite useful to read against the grain the text, for example. Try to find um, all kinds of um, biases or some things, uh, contradictions, and, and so on in the text, so that um, they might there might be some tensions that are like undercurrents that you don't necessarily notice immediately, but if you really uh, scrutinize the, let's say, text and uh, read it very critically, then you might uh, discover these or pay attention to these, um, these things. Questions, comments? No? Oh gosh, let's go on. Um, okay, so what's the difference between sources in legal history and juridical legal sources or legal sources in general? So basically what I'm claiming is that there is no such thing as a legal history source or legal historical source. You can use whatever sources you can possibly think of in order to answer your legal history research questions. It depends on the questions, what kind of sources you need to use. And there is no limitation there. You don't have to look at just legal um, sources, uh, whatever that means. You can use whatever sources you want to. And really, uh, you can be very imaginative there. So, the topics and questions you ask determine the sources um, and the sources depend on the research questions. This is quite obvious. So, use whatever sources you can possibly imagine in order to answer your questions. And now, in order to make you say something so that I can um, have a break in my monologue here. Um, I will invite you to um, discuss in your group, in a small group with um, your neighbor, what sources you think that could be used if you wanted to do research on legal work or legal professions, uh, let's say in Estonia or Finland or another country, um, between 1870 and 1950. So you are, who are with us on Skype, you can also um, contemplate what sources one could use in this kind of research. Okay, and now I am going to stop talking for a moment and get back to you on Skype uh, when um, these guys here in the audience have done their discussing uh, in their groups about the sources one can use for this kind of research. Go ahead. Kind of dying down here in the notes room. So um, let's start um, with um, what sources you would propose that could be used. Perhaps you on Skype could start. What sources would you propose to use if you <coughs> had to do research on the legal work, on legal work or the legal professions, let's say in Estonia or another country, between 1870 and 1950? I have a long list of possible sources. Okay, could you say a couple of them? I will write them on my whiteboard here. Uh, maybe the most interesting one uh, would be personal letters, if they are changed between lawyers themselves. Good, thank you. That's a good suggestion. I'll write it down. So letters and correspondence. 
wonders. Thank you. Do you want to propose something else? Yes, uh, maybe historical clothing, uh, like uh, the things that the lawyers used to wear. Uh, sometimes you can uh, um, uh, think uh, about the profession um, on how they were, uh, how they used to um, dress themselves if they went to court or, or something like that. Excellent, that's a very innovative source. You get 10 points. <laughs> Thank you. So, I wrote uh, on the whiteboard clothing, wigs, etc. because of course wigs and stuff like that are so very uh, part of the British court experience. Okay, so how about you in, in this uh, classroom, what would you propose? Newspapers. Yeah, excellent. Newspapers. I don't know how the digitalization of newspapers and journalists, journals is progressing in Estonia, but in Finland we have a really excellent uh, search engines with um, uh, basically all uh, newspapers and journals before roughly 1920 have been digitized and are available online and they are searchable so that they are really a very uh, important resource um, for this kind of thing among others. Yes. We have the same uh, for Estonian newspapers, historical newspapers, they are uh, in digital form uh, in uh, Estonian literature. They are uh, very, very easy accessible at the So are they online? Yes. Yes, okay. So good. Then you also here in Estonia have this magnificent resource uh, available should you want to study this particular topic or another related to the period. Good. Other um, propositions? Books. Books? What kind of books? Different, uh, not even uh, scientific books, uh, things, some stories about uh, lawyers and legal professions. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe scientific also. Yeah, like literature, yeah, like literature. novels and, and such. Yeah, good.
anything else? Depending on the profession, we're looking at perhaps also various types of procedure or like office-related documents, work, work documents. Yeah. Yeah, we are listening. I would also add uh, the documents of uh, disciplinary procedures. I think they would, very, would be very interesting to look at. Yes, you, you mean like uh, an, a bar associations, uh, yes. uh, internal disciplinary actions and so on. Yeah, that's, yes. that's a good suggestion. Thank you. And not only disciplinary actions, but also guidelines, I think. Mm, good, ethical guidelines. You have had really many uh, very good suggestions. Is there something that's still missing in your opinion? Anything related to accounting. <laughs> accounting. <laughs> or banking or <laughs> whatever you might have had. Okay, like, um, um, could you give an example? Receipts, uh, what they spent, uh, <laughs> how much money they had, what they did. Okay. Do you, so, you mean like their personal finances or law firm's finances or in general? Both. <laughs> okay. Perhaps we have come to an end, or does someone have 
something they still want to share, a notion of what kind of sorties could be used. What about the kind of the side cost of the of the of the year of the the ownership or if there's ownership at all or if it's something stable or, or if human life is valued differently or something like that. So all kind of books, literature, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course the whole context comes into the question and and what kind of legal culture that was. So anything that can elucidate actually the, the um, legal world in which these um, legal professionals worked, for example, or did their legal work would be useful for understanding uh, kind of what they did, why they, they did it the way they did, who they were, and so on. But there are so many sources out there regarding that, one also needs to be cautious so that one finishes the research at some point, and because there are always new interesting sources to be discovered and, and looked at and so on. Okay, so thank you for this. You have been really, really good at this exercise. Uh, I would like to say some more words on this particular topic and related to the sources uh, and take it as an example because this is one of my research interests at the moment. So I'm doing this kind of research in Finland. And of course that relates to this picture. If we think of uh, the map of, uh, of Europe, we are usually uh, reading in textbooks that there are two different ways of becoming a legal professional. One is uh, the uh, English or, um, let's say, um, well, let's say English way of uh, learning by doing in, at an inner court. So uh, barristers are created through um, practical work uh, at Inza Court and you didn't necessarily need traditionally a university education in order to become, for example, a judge or a, um, a barrister or a legal professional. So basically there was a practical training through various Inza Court. Inza Court both in um, for the, the Chancery and also for the criminal courts. So various things of court, depending on what kind of law you wanted to go into. And then, of course, there's also the continental model, and that is about uh, going to a university to study, getting your degree, and becoming a legal professional that way. Of course, there were also legal notaries uh, who had their own training more practical training to become a notary. So how does this mod model fit, for example, Scandinavia uh, or uh, some parts of Eastern Europe? Well, it doesn't. So you have the, the barrister in the English picture, you have les gens de justice, here on the continent, that's a French picture. They have their robes and uh, they are easily recognizable as um, practicing um, advocates. But if you look at that picture over there, what is the impression you get from that? Are those legal professionals there? Who are those people? When I showed this picture at a conference in Ireland, um, they thought that those were convicts sitting on a bench. Well, who are those people? Are they convicts waiting to be transported into a prison? Or who are they? Yes, they are judges. 
but what kind of judges are they? Good, that's points for you. That is a um, court from the Finnish countryside. So you can see the judge behind the desk, and that is the jury. And the jury, uh, they were co-judges together with the trained judge. So those were some of the, um, I wouldn't say legal professionals because that's misusing the term, but uh, some of the people doing legal work in these parts of Europe. So lay representation in courts, lay judges, they, they weren't necessarily legal professionals. Uh, they hadn't I, they haven't gone through either of the two education systems that we are usually being taught in our textbooks. So I would call this the third model of Europe. And of course, when you look at these kind of phenomena, then you can't use the same sources. You have to ask different questions altogether. So, when traditional approaches are not enough, like in this particular case. So, as I said, the traditional focus on the classical legal professions um, fit Finland or Scandinavia or Northeastern Europe uh, quite poorly. So, it doesn't describe the practice uh, of everyday life. So uh, this, because this professional uh, profession approach was actually um, designed or made for different parts of Europe altogether. So if we want to ask the same questions as um, other parts of Europe who have these uh, traditional and professional models, then we get results that, okay, we get results. They are not necessarily wrong results but they don't tell us much about the, the reality of uh, the legal culture in these parts of Europe. So, the legal culture was different, and that's why one wants to ask different kinds of questions. Like in these, peer, uh, these countries where the judiciary has been for centuries lay-dominated, uh, then, of course, one must ask different questions. And, actually, it could lead into a lead in to anachronisms and skew one's research results. So, um, I have adopted a new approach here, and that's scaling legal work, so that at the other end, there are the true professionals, and the other end of the spectrum, there are the um, ignoramuses of law who know absolutely nothing about law, and everyone else is somewhere on the scale. They might know something about uh, the law and how it works, or legal work. They um, might actually be, for example, um, members of local juries, co-judges with a professional judge, etc., uh, etc. Et so there are many different shades of grey if you want to use, perhaps, at this time already, a bit faded um, expression. And um, what actually this uh, says, this um, advertisement in the papers says that a young girl who has uh, studied law or worked in a, um, in a law office has a few good future ahead of her uh, working in, um, a tra um, in some kind of trade uh, enterprise. And uh, the um, um, answers to this advertisement are to be sent to um, the newspaper using the expression one who's, um, who knows about law and how to use it. So basically, um, 
she, the, the woman who they wanted to recruit, had studied law, not necessarily finished her law studies. She might be a university dropout, or she might have practical experience of the law. But she was who they wanted to have working in their office. She had expertise or skills where that were deemed necessary in this particular firm. And of course, uh, this kind of phenomenon is not interesting in a normal, professional, focusing research project. And that's why no one has looked at these women, for example, working in law offices, but without a formal degree in law. Okay, so um, when uh, new questions are required, also new sources are required, but let's start with the question of who actually did legal work? Who are the persons involved in some type of legal work? And what kind of clientele did they have? Did the true professionals cater um, uh, to similar clientels than, than the non professional people who did the same kind of stuff, like uh, acted as lay advocates at court. Um, then, of course, the so-called paralegals, as we would call them today, the auxiliary staff in law offices, just like the, the young lady the firm wanted to recruit in the advertisement we just saw. A woman who's skilled, who has knowledge about law, but who doesn't have a law degree. And then there's also the um, phenomenon of unpaid legal work that could be performed, for example, in a home, private home, and that left very few sources for us to analyze. Like uh, when, when there was an office hold, a male office holder in the family a civil servant, for example. In many cases, um, the whole family actually participated in the work that civil servant did in some way or another. So we don't actually know who was assisting and, for example, doing the writing required uh, in that particular job. It might be, for example, children, it might be wives, it might be um, brothers or unmarried sisters or mothers, it, it might be anyone. We don't know if we don't find sources that can tell us something about it. And of course also how they learned about law and how about them. they learned about legal work in general. And for example, in this uh, photograph, which was, of course, one of the sources you suggested for such a project, a good suggestion. This uh, photograph here shows the office of the first female um, advocate, the professional advocate, let's say like that, in Finland, Agnes Lundell, and this is from her office. So here you can see a woman in the margins because she is the only woman who had taken the necessary degree to become a true advocate. So she's in the margins. But there are also other people in the background who are even more marginalized than she in research. And those are the women who are assisting her in her law office. So obviously, working for years perhaps, or even decades, as a paralegal in a law office uh, gave you insight and skills uh, that were very strongly related to law and legal work. And I suggest that for such a project like this, one should focus from traditional figures to um, more marginal figures. So this is a true legal professional from the period. It's, uh, he became a procurator general of the Senate, which is something like um, um, the highest uh, judicial authority, uh, like the um, 
Chancellor of Justice or someone that who monitors the whole uh, um, judicial field. So that uh, Voldemort Sir Adrian, he was um, also a superior judge and a first instance judge in um, the Isthmus or Karelia in um, a part that's nowadays part of um, Russia. But then it was part of Finnish Karelia and um, uh, the legal district of Alaba was quite large. And he is a very traditional figure that the traditional uh, process, uh, uh, research would want to focus on. But I'm suggesting here that we should look at someone quite different. These are his daughters, the two eldest daughters. He had eight daughters and a couple of sons, so he was a busy man also in his personal life. And why are these girls interesting for this kind of project? Any idea? Any suggestion? Why, are, why, why am I showing their uh, photograph here and saying that we should look at them closely and, and not at their father, who is the real lawyer, very successful one? Uh, the true workforce behind him? Precisely. They were, uh, the, the eight daughters formed his law office. They did all the writing for this judge. We have uh, memoirs of one of the daughters, our Sir Daniel, who um, went to become uh, the first history professor in Finland. So she has written her memoirs and describes in detail how the, the eight daughters sat each uh, behind their own desk doing writing in a fren frenzied way. And they were not just doing it for fun or for a sense of obligation, they were also getting some pocket money out of it. So Alma Sereria remembers that she bought a watch with this money she earned as a um, scribe to um, her father. But they were, when they were uh, old enough that um, they could write very neatly, they were recruited by the father to be this team of office workers or child labor, if you want. So I'm suggesting that there might be dozens of cases like this. We just don't know because we don't have the sources. So that's why when we find these rare glimpses in the sources, they kind of suggest that there might be more. Uh, this might be um, um, not perhaps a general practice among the elite in Finland at the time, that the daughters of the elite are, are actually doing a lot of work for their fathers, but at least that it was uh, seen as uh, normal and ordinary in some families belonging to the elite, even in these families even though perhaps um, ordinarily they would be um, taught to um, play the piano nicely and to embroider nicely and sing nicely and speak uh, foreign languages so that they could attract a husband. But of course, which of course most of them did anyway, but still these girls did much more than that. They also were actually running the enterprise that uh, their father was the C CEO of, if you want to leave that way, because the um, district um, judges they were kind of kind of a, they were kind of feudal lords, so that they were running the business and they were using also their own families sometimes as workforce. She played in this sense. Yes, ma'am. Was this couple of sons also employed with the office? No. They were studying at the university. And actually some of the girls also studied at the university. And of course the training judges that the father had were also uh, living in the house with the family. So some of the daughters actually married some of the training judges living with the family. 
and of course they were also discussing all the cases they heard um, in the law session, on the court sessions, at table, um, in the family discussions. So they also learned about the law that way, not just writing down all the um, documents that the court produced. And of course then you um, have the sources. And for these kind of cases, there's the traditional needle and haystack dilemma, how to find a needle in a haystack. So cases like this that you kind of come across by accident are really uh, exciting. Um, but nowadays the technique is helping us. Um, we also already mentioned the digitalization projects and uh, search engines with, with fuzzy searches. Um, one can use law firms advertisements, law firms archives, if these are available, and private correspondence. This is an example of um, the CEO of um, an important law firm that's still operating today, and his private correspondence with his secretary, who was running the legal office when he was um, fighting uh, during World War II on the Eastern Front. Or actually he was a judge in the military court, so he wasn't so much fighting in the trenches. But anyway, uh, because of this correspondence, we know what uh, a law firm did and what, the, what she was doing when running the law firm. And then he was writing instructions to her. Um, she was replying. Um, not only sending warm socks and alcohol to keep him warm during winter, the winter war, for example, but also, also discussing the whole time the cases the law firm was dealing with. And luckily, this is not part of the archive of the law firm. That's why I have full access to this material, because it's private correspondence. Then, of course, estate inventories that might tell, uh, especially for the earlier period, what kind of books people owned and read. Then, job ads that we have already been discussing. And memoirs, pictures, I mean, like movies, um, also fil films and, and pictures, photographs. Uh, literature was mentioned, but also chiclet. So I have been reading, for my project, I have been reading Chiclet, uh, Light Entertaining Literature for Women, written by women from the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s. So this book um, I have here is called Independent Woman. That kind of uh, says something about the, the book and its topic. And there's a, a woman who is doing uh, office work, and that's why there's the typewriter over there. Phone books can also be used as, as sources to find out about which law firms operated in a certain area. And also patent registers, registers of companies, etc. So some other types of sources. And this is from a very famous Finnish film called Tuomari Marta, Judge Marta. It's based on a play that was somewhat earlier. And it's interesting to read both the, the novel that's, or the play itself and then the film version, which is a bit later, as, and compare the differences, what, have, what the uh, producers of the film have changed uh, in comparison to the original text from the 1930s. So it's about a woman who is a judge and how she tries to balance her private life and family life with uh, the um, duties uh, as a judge and a professional woman. Of course, there's a moral here uh, so that women were not encouraged to forsake their family obligations to pursue careers in law as judges. And here are some examples of uh, these ads you can find in papers, um, all kinds of um, legal work in various sizes and various types of professionalization. 
can be found in these apps. So there's a whole range of, of gliding scale again of uh, firms offering some kind of legal services or individuals for that matter. So I would like to conclude with this. Um, so I'm a source fetishist. I like sources. Uh, the more sources, the better. That's my um, personal credo. But of course, what is not important is just the quantity of sources, but what one does with the sources. So basically, solid, deep going, and perceptive analysis of the sources is the key, not the quantity, but the quality of the analysis. For me, researching is like exploring the world, going to the Antarctic or to the jungles of South Africa, or doing detective work like Sherlock Holmes and discovering things and links that perhaps haven't been discovered before. And I am all for an openness to new things and innovation, and we are discussing some of the sources here. And um, as I said, there are no legal historical sources. They are just legal historical research questions and sources that may answer these questions. So basically, the sky is the limit. And uh, I would like to wish you, all you who are uh, pursuing your doctoral dissertation, good luck. Enjoy your sources, whatever they are, and um, finish excellent uh, dissertations. Thank you. And Thank now, you. If, if there's someone who wants to ask a question or comment, please feel free to do so now. I didn't want to uh, hold people uh, here too, too much longer, but uh, I was wondering if uh, legal historians might have any interesting uh, new IT tools for doing their research, for uh, browsing through all, the, all those old materials uh, in addition to having them online. I don't know. You tell me if you have any or, or problems. Well, I love going to the archive and actually following the source, try, uh, um, actually having it in my hand. So I'm kind of trying to resist the temptation of going to that book that Mary is guarding there and, and perusing through the source. Uh, I kind of like to get the feel of it myself. And, um, well, perhaps it's not related to this, but I would always uh, um, like to recommend going to the actual source and not just accessing it through secondary literature. Because people are kind of uh, repeating um, themselves and perhaps adding new errors to uh, something that has already been made. So often the best solution, for me at least, is to see actually what is said. For example, research literature, um, if, if you read some um, book that you have um, accessed through other, other people's texts, I would recommend that you actually read the book yourself or the article yourself uh, and get um, a proper personal idea of what, what they are trying to say. So perhaps this is <laughs> all the advice but I can give you. Uh, how, how much uh, help do these uh, digital, uh, digitalized uh, okay. materials yeah. provide? Are you able to find your needle in the haystack quicker thanks to them or not? Sometimes, yes. Um, and of course, uh, the nice thing is that you don't necessarily go, need to uh, go to another country, try to get funding for your research trip and stay for a week, uh, for example, or two weeks in a foreign country uh, and sit uh, in the archive if you can do it comfortably in your own house, for example. Um, have your coffee mug there and just look at the sources. But of course, it has its limitations and its limits. Because, for example, the quality of the photographs uh, are not necessarily always so brilliant. And sometimes 
um, the margins, um, you might have difficulty seeing what's actually written in the margins because the book or the binding goes like this. If you have the actual manuscript or source in your hand, you can, you can tilt it and read it better. So that sometimes, even though you have access um, to the source uh, through images, you need to go and check what is actually said in certain parts of, of the book, because the image is not just clear, isn't clear enough. And of course, um, there are also digitalized uh, image archives, photo archives that one can use and search into, so that is also very useful. And some of them uh, have also been made available free of charge, so that one can really use as many of them as illustrations in one's book without having to think about the costs what um, it takes to get permission to, to publish all those images. Okay, if there are no other questions, well, I'm sure we can continue discussions over dinner today. And if there are activities during the course, uh, anyway, if, if someone has something on their heart, I will want to ask something or discuss something. So thanks and my goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.